Well, we are in the book of Colossians, as you know, and we uh, concluded last week with verse 15. So this week we finished the chapter with Colossians 2, verses 16 through 23. Paul has been teaching on all that Christ has done and what has happened to us in him. We're a new creation. Everything's new. He's defeated disarmed the rulers and authorities, he said in verse 15. All the demonic host, the angelic realm that is hostile to us has been defeated by him. Doesn't mean they're not there, they are, and we deal with them, but we have the advantage now, and it's in Christ, and it's what he's done for us. So now he moves on to another issue, beginning with verse 16. Therefore... And it is in light of everything that he said, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day, things which are a mere shadow of what is to come. But the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one keep defrauding you of your prize by delighting in self-abasement and the worship of angels, taking his stand on visions he has seen, inflated without cause by his fleshly mind and not holding fast to the head from whom the entire body being supplied and held together by the joints and ligaments grows with a growth which is from God. If you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why, as if you were living in the world, do you submit yourself to decrees such as do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, which all refer to things destined to perish with the use, in accordance with the commandments and teachings of men? These are matters which have to do, which have, to be sure, the appearance of wisdom in self-made religion and self-abasement and severe treatment of the body, but are of no value against fleshly indulgence. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow in a word of prayer. In his autobiography, Up from Slavery, Booker T. Washington wrote, that the first knowledge he had that he was a slave was one morning when he was awakened by his mother fervently praying, he said, over her children, that Mr. Lincoln and his armies might be successful and she and her children might be free. Fervently praying. It gives some sense of how intense the longing for freedom is for a person in bondage. And it illustrates what a great blessing the gospel is because it brings freedom, the greatest freedom, spiritual freedom. Paul told the Galatians that it was for freedom that Christ set us free. Now can you imagine a slave being liberated, being allowed to leave the fields where he sweated and toiled, go out into the wide world only to return and choose to be back in chains and under the lash. Now that seems absurd, and it is, and yet that's what Christians do. One of the first things they want to give up is their freedom. So Paul told the Galatians, do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. The same insanity was in Colossae. Paul told the Christians there that they are complete in Christ, that they have fullness in him. That completeness that they have, that fullness that they have includes their liberty. But false teachers had come to town and were telling them that they were not complete. Christ is not enough. They needed more than Christ. They needed the law of Moses, and they needed the secrets that these teachers had. 
It's all really a yoke of bondage that they were putting on the necks of those Christians. And Paul exposed it. In Colossians 2, verses 16 through 23, he warned against three aspects of the heresy. It really breaks it down for us, what they were being taught, what they needed to avoid. In verses uh, 1 through, uh, rather, 16 and 17, he warns against legalism. That's the first aspect of this heresy, putting them under the law. Then in verses 18 and 19, he warns against mysticism. And finally, in verses 20 through 23, he warns against asceticism, austere self-denial, do not taste, do not touch. The false teachers might have had slogans like, knowledge is power and the truth shall set you free. Paul would have answered, yes, those slogans are true, but you're not teaching that, not really. You're teaching lies that enslave. It demonstrated that first from their abuse of the law of Moses. They were imposing rules in areas of diet and days. Paul begins, therefore. That's how he starts off this, this section in verse 16. Therefore, which always points us back to something that he had said previously. He's drawing upon previous teaching to make a point. And what Paul had said is that in Christ, through his sacrifice on the cross, God has made us alive. God has made us new creatures. He has forgiven our sins completely, past, present, and future. All of that has been forgiven, the guilt has been removed, and he has, in addition to that, defeated our enemies, defeated the angelic powers, led them in a victorious triumph, he said, powers that are against us. He has, he said, set us free. Now, in view of all of that, Paul says, don't let anyone judge you in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day. You're free from that. Food and diet were very, a very important part of the law. Even today, religious Jews keep a kosher diet, which is based basically on the law. That's not altogether true. Some of it is uh, tradition that has been passed down, but it's based upon the, uh, the principle of a separation of the clean from the unclean. Clean animals, unclean animals. Now there may have been some health benefits in the diet, but that was not the point of the law. The reason for the separation of animals, the reason for the separation of food, and this principle applies to the separation of uh, materials in clothing as well as the separation in days of the, the calendar and of the week. The reason for that was uh, educational. It, uh, it was a didactic tool and a means of instruction to remind the people to be holy, to be set apart. And you have heard me say this, I'm sure, before, but in explaining the word holy, basically it means to be set apart. It means to be separated from, separated from the world, but also separated to or dedicated to God. So that's the essence of holiness. It's separation. And in the moral aspect of holiness, the purity of conduct and thought follows from that because we're separated from the world and separated to God. We live and we think differently. All of that's illustrated in the separation of things, animals, for example. The, the fact that this was didactic and not hygienic, it was for instruction and not health, is clear from passages like Mark chapter 7, verse 18 through 20, where Jesus said, it's not what a person eats that defiles the person. It's not what goes into the stomach and is eliminated that defiles the person. It goes into the person's heart. And then Mark adds, he, declares, he declared all foods clean. 
Well, that's something different from what had been taught under the law because every time they sat down to a meal or every time they prepared a meal, they were being taught separation. They were taught, you must be holy. That's what it was all about. But food itself wasn't, wasn't bad. And, and as Mark says, when Jesus gave that instruction, he declared all foods clean. Also, because he fulfilled the law by his life and sacrifice, all those distinctions in the law were abolished. And that fact was made very clear to Peter when he was in the town of Joppa and he had a vision. It's found in Acts chapter 10. Peter had this vision of a sheet coming down from heaven filled with unclean animals. God said, get up, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter was repulsed. He said, by no means, Lord. You can imagine what was in that sheet. Pigs and dogs, snakes and bats, lizards, maybe a horse. But it wasn't the creepiness of the cuisine that offended Peter, but his concern for the law. He'd been raised on this. It, it had been ingrained in his thinking and in the thinking of his ancestors. You don't eat certain things. It's prohibited. It taught him that he couldn't eat a horse. So he refused. What a contradiction that is. God says, do this, and Peter, out of a sense of piety and obedience, says, I'm not going to do it. Refuses the command of God. But the Lord answered, what God has cleansed no longer consider unclean. Dietary laws are no longer binding. Spirituality is not attained or measured by what a person eats or refuses to drink. Now, you don't have to eat things or drink things. You don't have to eat pork or drink wine. You're not commanded to eat those things. If you prefer Perrier and Fagua to those things, that's fine. But but abstaining has no spiritual merit because it's all clean. God's declared it so. We are to live appropriately. We are to live carefully. We're to live wisely. We're to be careful about uh, what and how we eat and drink, about, uh, about how we dress, about how we behave. All of that's important. Everything we do is important. It reflects our walk with God and it reflects on our profession of faith. The way we behave in all aspects of life is a witness. It says a lot about us. We're to do all to the glory of God from the simplest things like eating and drinking to laying down our lives for one another. From the mundane to the sublime, everything we do is to be done to God's glory. That's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And verse 31, but we're no longer under the law of Moses. The old covenant is done. It's served its purpose. We are people of the new covenant. The law is written on our hearts, not tablets of stone. God is done, finished with religious diets. It's the same with the religious calendar, with observing the Sabbath and the feast days. Under the law, the Israelites were to go up to Jerusalem, go to Shiloh originally, and then up to Jerusalem when the tabernacle had been taken there and the temple had been built there three times a year. That was required. And they were to keep the Sabbath every week. Um, this is part of the law. That was the religious calendar, observing the Sabbath and the feast days. And again, when Christ came, he fulfilled the law. We're no longer under the law's regulations. Paul said that very thing in Romans chapter 6, verse 14. You are not under law, but grace. Romans 7, verse 4. You were made to die to the law. In fact, all of these things, diets and days, belong to the category of types and shadows of the Old Testament. 
Again, they were instructive for the people of God. That was their purpose, to instruct them daily in everything they did. Their whole life was arranged so that they were being instructed to be holy. And the law, in that sense, still does teach us. We read the law, and we read about the dietary regulations and clothing regulations, all that. It reminds us that we're to be holy people, just like that taught. That we're not under those rules and regulations. Paul said that in Galatians chapter 3, verse 24. He described the law as a tutor. He described it as a teacher or a disciplinarian given, he said, to lead us to Christ so that we might be justified by faith. That was the purpose of the law, and it did that. It accomplished that purpose. So we are now no longer under it. We no longer need a tutor. We no longer need this teacher or this, um, this uh, disciplinarian. And here in verse 17, he says much that same thing, that these things food and drink and a Sabbath day were a mere shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Literally, this word substance is the word body, soma. And the picture Paul gives is of a person casting a shadow, which is a kind of outline of the person. You get a faint image of what that person is, and it goes before the person oftentimes. You can tell a person's coming because there's this shadow. And that's how the types and, and pictures of the Old Testament, the, the special days and ceremonies of the Old Testament worked. They gave a faint picture of the Lord and foreshadowed or predicted His coming. For example, the the sacrifice of the Passover, which celebrated Israel's deliverance from slavery in Egypt, prefigured the Lord's sacrifice that delivered every believer from God's judgment and from slavery to sin. The Feast of Unleavened Bread that followed the Passover pictured the Christian life, which, is Christ, which Christ's sacrifice made possible for us. This is how Paul explained it in 1 Corinthians 5, verses 7 and 8. Well, the same is so with the Sabbath. The, the physical rest of the seventh day pictures the spiritual rest of salvation. We have it in Christ now, and in the future we have it in heaven to come. All of that is what the, 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 the Sabbath pictured. That's Hebrews chapter 4, verses 9, and verse 9. There are Christians today, good people, godly people, who believe that Sunday is the Christian Sabbath and that it should be observed according to the Sabbath laws. They don't observe it on Saturday. They observe it on Sunday. They don't observe it on the last day of the week as it is to be observed. They observe it on the first day of the week, which to my mind, is a complete con contradiction in terms, but nevertheless, they're godly people who take that very serious view of Sunday as the Christian Sabbath. I respect them, but I have to disagree with that. The Sabbath was given as a sign of the Old Covenant. That's how it's described in Exodus 31, verse 13, for example. It was a sign between God and Israel. When the Old Covenant ended, the sign of the Old Covenant ceased to be binding. We do observe Sunday, but as the Lord's Day, and in remembrance of the resurrection, not because of Exodus 20, verse 8, and the fourth commandment. We're no longer under its rules. We are not to be casual about Sunday, I should say that, Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25 warns against forsaking our own assembling together. Sunday is when we assemble together as a church, and it's, it's necessary. But it's not the Sabbath, and Sunday is never called the Sabbath in the Scriptures. And Paul makes it clear here that it has ceased he said, no one is to be our judge in regard to a Sabbath day. 
No one is allowed to enforce it on us. It is a shadow, he says. It has passed away. All the, uh, the Jewish days have. They foreshadowed the Lord's coming and they illustrated his person and work, but they are to him what a shadow is to a body, a faint outline. The body is the substance and the reality. Now, since Christ has come and believers possess the reality, Christ in us, we don't need the shadow. So, why live in the shadows when we have the reality? Why hold on to a, a dim sketch when we have the person? There's no reason to, of course. So Paul was saying, don't let people judge you as being incomplete. And don't let anyone put you under the heavy yoke of the law. Christ has fulfilled the law and set you free. So live that way. Live free. One reason the false teachers were able to have an influence over the Colossians was that they quoted the Bible. Obviously, they knew the law. They were quoting the law of Moses. They quoted the Bible. That, that seemed to give credence to their teaching and made them persuasive. But all heresy claims to be biblical. I'm talking about Christian heresy. Satan knows the Bible. He's a skillful theologian. That's why he's able to disguise himself, as Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 14, as an angel of light. And so do his, uh, his ministers. The only way to overcome that is by knowing the Bible. And we have no better instruction on doing that, no greater example of doing that than our Lord himself. That's how he answered the temptations of Satan in the wilderness. They didn't debate him uh, on logical, rational ways. So that's not, not forbidden, but he cut right to the chase. He cut right, came right to the point. He answered every temptation of the devil, the three that are recorded there, with Scripture. And then he overcame them in that way. That's the way we, that's the way we deal with these kinds of people. Scripture is our sword. If we don't learn the Scriptures and if we don't know how to apply the Scriptures, we're helpless. We're defenseless. Scripture's our sword. But these men, they had Scripture. They twisted it, but they quoted Scripture. But they had something more than that. They had a claim to authority beyond the Bible. They claimed to have visions. Their, their heresy had a mystical aspect that gave it more weight and appeal. Something that I'm sure they could have used to overcome the objection of Scripture. Oh, but I've had this vision. This is mysticism. The mysticism that Paul warns against uh, and uh, what he, in verse 18 exposes as a hoax. Let no one, he writes, keep defrauding you of your prize by delighting in self-abasement and the worship of angels, taking a stand on visions he has seen, inflated without cause by his fleshly mind. All of this is, has its origin in a fleshly, not a spiritual mind. Mysticism is basically experiencing God directly apart from the Bible, experiencing God through visions and ecstatic experiences. Th these men claim to have such a personal experience with angels and with God himself. And there were Jewish mystics around this time who believed that by practicing the details of the law and ceremonial cleansings that their soul could ascend into heaven and to the throne of God. And so that may be the kind of people that Paul is dealing with here. It may be that he's dealing with some Jewish mystics that had come to Colossae. They claim to know the way to a higher spiritual plane, to deep spiritual experience. And 
claim to be initiated into sacred mysteries. That's impressive stuff, and people can get taken in by it. That's what Paul warns against, not letting these people defraud them by their boastful claims, which he dismisses as inflated without cause. There's nothing to these claims is what he's saying. Being under the influence of such, uh, such people who are self-proclaimed prophets is slavery. Because those under their persuasion are dependent upon them. Dependent upon their understanding and direction in life. Uh, people look less to the Bible for, knowledge, for the knowledge of God and direction in life when they've got a prophet. Why look to the Bible? when you have a prophet to tell you what to do and to unveil everything for you. And that's what they claim, these people claim to be. These kind of people had direct communion with God. They had visions, they had dreams, and they had this extra revelation. And so why study the scriptures when you've got your prophet to teach you and direct you? But in that case, then a person is completely dependent on their prophet or their leader or their guru. And he can defraud the person who's dependent upon him, or as the New International Version has it, disqualify you for the prize. Now that, that has the idea of, uh, of, the, uh, of acting like an umpire, calling balls and strikes. That's what these men were doing. That's what these mystics had the authority, at least in their mind, and as these who subjected themselves to were recognizing that they were the umpires. They are the ones that, that called the shots for these people. And he or she, this, these mystics, these false teachers, would make judgments. They'd issue decrees. They'd put people on a false path through their statements and their teachings lead them into error, lead them into terrible loss, do all that by leading them away from the truth, right away from Scripture. In that way, they defrauded people. This isn't unusual. There have been people like this, charismatic types, down through the history of the church. In the second century, not long, a generation or so after Paul wrote this letter, a man named Montanus with two women prophetesses moved through the region where Colossae was located. He was a forerunner of the modern day charismatics. He gained a huge following within Asia Minor for just a brief time, but made predictions about the coming of Christ, the coming of the paraclete, actually, the coming of the spirit. He was confused in his theology, but he was charismatic. He was a man that really gained a lot of uh, followers. Martin Luther had to deal with a group who camped in Wittenberg called the Zwickau Prophets. They were there while he was hiding in Wartburg Castle, Castle after his stand at the Diet of Worms. And there at the Wartburg, he was translating the New Testament when this group came in to Wittenberg and began to make quite a splash there and have an influence. And so Luther had to deal with that group. He um, left the, the, the castle, left, came out of hiding and came back to Wittenberg and he dealt with it. Of course, Luther, in contrast to these prophets, so-called, was the man who taught, believed in, Sola Scriptura, Scripture alone, that's our authority, not extra charismatic experiences. So he drove them out of town successfully. There will always be these kinds of people is what I'm trying to tell you. Uh, and there will always be people that are drawn to them. Visions are impressive. And there is the allure in all of this of special knowledge, of being a a part of a select circle of people. C.S. Lewis wrote about that in an essay titled The Inner Ring and the desire people have to be part of it. I think 
the background of that is his time at uh, Oxford and then at Cambridge and being on the inside of the, of the inner circle in these academic groups, but it's wherever you are. It's at work, or it's in the neighborhood perhaps, at school. There's an inner circle that people want to be a part of, really desire to penetrate and be on the inside. And, and Lewis speaks of the terror of being on the outside. And yet he says, uh, you get into the inner circle and you find that there's really nothing there at all. It's dangerous to desire that kind of thing. It is slavery as well. It's bondage to pride, self-interest. But again, as he points out in his essay and is true to experience, there's nothing in the inner circle that's of much value. Well, there was uh, nothing to the inner ring of the mystics either that Paul exposes here. They were men of a fleshly mind. They were unregenerate. They're unbelievers. And so they're unconnected to Christ, have nothing to do with Christ. They speak of him, but they have nothing to do with him. That's how Paul describes him in verse 19, not holding fast to the head, not united with Christ. And he illustrates that with the human body, with joints and ligaments that, that join the body together. And just as a body is joined together in that way, joined together with ligaments and tissues, it can only live and grow in connection with the head. It has to be joined to the head or it's not alive. And so too in the church, the, the body of Christ is joined together. We're joined to one another but our life comes not from one another, but from the head. We're joined to Christ. He's the source of our vitality and growth. These men, for all of their grand claims to have had visions and to know the law of God, were outside of Christ. They had no spiritual life. And so there was no reality to their claims. But they were not only convincing because of their apparent knowledge of the law and impressive because of their claims of visions and contact with angels, they appeared to be completely dedicated. They practiced asceticism, which is an austere life of self-denial, of abstaining from material pleasures for the purpose of enlightenment or for the purpose of gaining favor with God. I imagine they had a, a look of piety about them, pale, gaunt men who spoke of all they denied themselves with the same show of humility that they had when they spoke of all the visions they had and all the encounters they had with angels. Paul exposes the error of it. But he begins by telling the Colossians that they have died to all of that to the elementary principles of the world, to the law, to human religion. They've died to all of that, so they can't go back to that. Then in verse 21, he gives the rules and regulations of the elementary principles. It's all joyless and negative. Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. That's human religion. The, the idea that negative rules are the means to spiritual growth or that God is pleased when we beggar ourselves, when we deny ourselves. It's the opposite of what pleases God. Who, who invented eating and drinking? Who invented comfort and pleasure? Who created all the stuff we consume and that nourishes us? Well, obviously, God having created all of that and created all of that for that purpose can't think it bad if we eat and enjoy it. Paul would later warn against this kind of thing in 1 Timothy 4 when he criticizes men who forbid marriage and abstain from food that God has created to be gratefully shared in by believers. We're to be grateful for it and enjoy it. Paul wrote, for everything created by God is good. 
And, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with gratitude. 1 Timothy 4, verse 4. That's not to say that we don't need to practice restraint. We do, of course. It can be a matter of health. The Bible teaches moderation, not overindulgence. But rejecting food for religious reasons, because a simple plate of vegetables is more spiritual than a box of pizza or a bowl of ice cream, or it's wrong to enjoy the, the, the pleasure of a meal, is ingratitude. And it's false religion. In fact, in verse 22, Paul shows the absurdity of forbidding eating and drinking by stating that that's the reason God gave food. These things, he said, are destined to perish with the use. That's what they were designed to do, to perish with the use. In other words, food was created to be consumed. It was created to support life. And it meets its destiny, it fulfills its purpose when it's used to the full, when it nourishes the body and satisfies the appetite. Food's not bad, it is good. So the, the really spiritual person, the mature Christian, eats with pleasure and thanksgiving. Doesn't overindulge but he's thankful and enjoys what he has. He appreciates the goodness of God. If the Jewish diet, the diet under the law rather, was to remind them to be holy, then today food for us should remind us of what a good and faithful God we have and, and rejoice in him and be reminded every time we eat of his faithful, abundant provision to us. Now, that exposes the error of asceticism, this notion of uh, spirituality through self-denial. And it does that in two ways. First, asceticism contradicts God's design for life. It contradicts God's providence. God has filled this world with life, plant life, animal life, that is so abundant and so constant that it sustains billions of people all across this globe every day. This world is a food-producing, life-promoting machine. There's nothing like it in the solar system. And as far as we have found, nothing like it in the galaxy. I don't think we're ever going to find anything like this. This world is unique. Planet Earth is unique. So it's an insult to God's common grace to reject it as bad. Secondly, things destined to perish can have little or nothing to do with spiritual things that are lasting and eternal. The immaterial soul is not fed by material things. Oh, it's not touched or harmed by material things. Jesus said, it's not what enters into the mouth that defiles the man, but what proceeds out of the mouth that defiles the man. It's not what goes into the stomach that defiles a person and is eliminated. It's what goes into the heart. And what goes into the heart, what proceeds out of the mouth, is error, is false teaching. is the very thing that Paul is dealing with here. That's the danger spiritually. The food or clothing in the, the law that was either uh, promoted or prohibited, didn't have spiritual life or spiritual death in it, in them, in any of those things. They were for instruction only. They illustrated spiritual truth. They didn't impart spiritual life or death. But as Paul says in verse 23... These prohibitions on good things God has given us, prohibitions on pleasure, have the appearance of wisdom, but in reality are all just self-made religion. And self-made religion is false. It's all about earning favor with God. It, it's an exercise in pride. 
Kent Hughes in his commentary put it well. He wrote, asceticism feeds the flesh by starving it. George Whitfield discovered that by experience. When he was a student at Oxford, he began to have religious convictions. He became friends with the Wesleys. They were all part of a, a club at Oxford called the Holy Club. And it wasn't a Christian club. They thought it was at the time. But they began to live a very strict life. And Whitfield became an ascetic, a mystic as well. And he practiced a, a, a religion of self-denial. And he wrote about this in his journal. He said, I always chose the worst sort of food. I fasted twice a week. My apparel, my clothing, was mean. I wore a patched gown and dirty shoes and resolutely persisted in these voluntary acts of self-denial. It was when he began reading the scriptures and praying over them that daily, he said, he received fresh life, light, and power from above. That was when he was converted. And then he understood, as he put it, the glorious liberty of Christ's gospel. And he never again turned to asceticism, legalism, mysticism, or views of Christian perfectionism. That's the only way to escape any kind of enslaving error. It's through the light of God's Word. That's how Paul instructed the Colossians. He reminded them of what Christ had done for them. He asked them in, in verse 20 if they had died with Christ. Because if they had, then they had died to their old life and to any form of works religion. They died to all of that. They had died to the law and its regulations. Why would they want to return to that? Why indeed? And yet, we are faced with the temptation to believe all kinds of error, to conform to all kinds of things, all kinds of disparate kinds of things, to conform to the world and its way of doing things, to, to conform to the immorality of the age as well as to conform to the, the rules and the taboos and the forms of uh, religion like we have here. There's all kinds of temptations out there that pull us in every kind of direction daily. That's why we need to continually remind ourselves of what we are in Christ, that because of his death for us, we are a new creation. We died to the world and its ways, and he now lives in us. We can never go back. And why would we want to? It's like a, a freed slave returning to the fields and the overseers, or uh, going back to the chain at an oar on a slave ship. Why would he want, one want to do that? That, that I think of, of uh, Mr. Washington's mother fervently praying over her children that they would be free. And I think that's the Apostle Paul praying for his spiritual children that they would stay free. That calls for earnest, fervent prayer for ourselves and for one another. And it calls for an earnest, constant study of Scripture. Jesus said, the truth will make you free, and it will allow us to stay free. So we must continually remind ourselves of who we are in Christ. Romans 6, verse 11 and 12, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus, and do not let sin reign in your mortal bodies. In Christ, all the fullness of deity dwells, and he dwells in us. That's the, the great mystery that Paul spoke of in chapter 1. We are complete. Nothing can add to what he has already done. Nothing can add to what we already have. We must reckon it to be true, consider it to be so, and live by faith. That's the challenge. 
We can do it by grace alone. That's what we are to pray for. But that's the full life. That's the free life. That's the wise and joyful life. It begins by faith alone. It begins by believing the good news that Jesus Christ is both Christ, is both God and man who died for sinners, bore the penalty of sin in our place so that all who believe in him would be saved. If you've not believed, you are in the worst kind of slavery and doomed for all eternity. Don't dismiss that. Don't ignore that. Flee to Christ. Believe in him. He is the only solution. And he receives all who come to him, all who trust in him. And then live joyfully in the freedom that he has given you. God help us all to do that. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for the freedom we have in Christ. We thank you for what you have done for us in him. You have broken the chains of a bondage that is sin. You have broken the power of it. We still have the principle within us. We still fail. We fail every day, fail every moment. But sin isn't the master any longer. And in the power of the Spirit, we can live obediently and victoriously. And we can gain victory and freedom from error error like this that would enslave us to all kinds of rules and regulations that have nothing to do with our relationship with you. Help us to be wise. Help us to be men and women that study your word, gain wisdom, and know how to live well and live rightly. Uh, again, we do that by your grace. We pray for your grace and your mercy that we might live lives that bring honor and glory to you. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.